Welcome to the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast, the official podcast of Ryan Johnson Ministries. This podcast was created for the purpose of equipping others for the advancement of the kingdom of God. We hope that you enjoy this episode and encourage you to subscribe to the Blacksmith Chronicles today. For more information about Ryan Johnson Ministries, please visit www.ryanjohnson.us or email us directly at info at ryanjohnson.us. Hey guys, welcome to the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast. This week's episode is a little different. First of all, I'm outside in a screened in porch here in uh, the countryside of East Tennessee in the mountains. And it's raining a little bit, so if you hear a little bit of the background noise, I think it's nostalgic, so it's a beautiful thing. But nevertheless, I have our week's guest with us, who is someone that I consider a friend, someone that I consider a true woman of God, someone that walks with an apostolic anointing, a prophetic call definitely within her life, understanding the role and identity of a prophet, someone that is not only just saying things, but actually doing them, backing them up. You know, it's, it's, it's a life that's more than uh, some social media tweets and shares and likes and, and so on and so forth. Uh, there is a little bit of an intimidation factor because my guest has written more books than possibly is in the uh, Library of Congress by now. So uh, she's written so many books, it's unbelievable. Uh, the talent, the anointing that is upon her life. I'm thankful to have her uh, this week. I want to just introduce everyone to the one and only Miss Jennifer LeClaire. Jennifer, thank you so much for being part of this week's episode. Hey, Ryan, thanks for having me on. It's long overdue. We're actually switching roles because I usually interview you on my, my, so I'm like, okay, I'm going to invade your, you know, your follower list here, but it's good. And I think that uh, what we're going to talk about today is going to open some eyes in ways that maybe people don't expect. Because you, you've got some up, up your sleeve today, I know, to talk about that. I was like, okay, yeah, let's do that. Let's jump in it. Let's get controversial. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, Jennifer falls in, for those of you that may not be familiar with Jennifer's story, it's, it's, she falls in the category that often a lot of people love to dissect and pick apart every single thing that they're saying and there's multiple reasons behind that one is individuals can have a false insecurity about themselves and they have wrong mentality about who god can use and in that one of the things that i really just respect i mean a ton of respect for jennifer is her steadfast her faithfulness and her willing to continue no matter what has been thrown her way But this is what I want people to understand. I want to hear, I want them to hear the story because a lot of people may not be familiar with the beginning of born again, Jennifer LeClaire. And so what I want to ask you, if you could share with us how it was you came to Christ. Yeah. So the short version, because the long version would be an hour, uh, you know, I didn't grow up in the church. Um, my parents grew up in the church. They were Christians, but there was no strong Christian influence in terms of church attendance. They were, um, uh, not of that persuasion. So, um, you know, I grew up like everybody else, seventies, eighties, and, um, you know, smoked weed, you know, went out and drank alcohol, did all those things that people who don't know the Lord do. Um, I met my daughter's father when I was 19 years old. Um, we were going to college together. He was the photo editor, and I was the editor of the newspaper, uh, the school paper in college. And so we connected. Uh, we got married some years later, had a child, beautiful girl. Uh, and uh, then he sort of had a midlife crisis at the age of 30 and left, went to another country, never saw him again. So at that point, um, you know, I was angry. I was mad. Um, I was hurt, although if I'm honest, I was sort of willing to let him go. What I wasn't willing to do is have a daughter without a father and crying every night for daddy. So around this same time, about three, four months after he left, um, I was falsely accused of a crime I didn't commit. Long story short, uh, police officers showed up, um, you know, said, you know, I'm trying to condense this, but he, when we were much younger, he came home acting crazy 
And I said, you need to calm down. I'm going to call the police. He didn't calm down. I called the police. Uh, fast forward several years later, several years after, uh, the, this police officer showed up. I said, you sit over here. I sat over there. I, I scooted over two steps and she picked me up and started beating me, literally beating me, um, slamming me against the car, beating me with her club. I had bruises all over my body and I was put in jail. Uh, I was charged with battery on a law enforcement officer, which carries a five-year prison sentence uh, and resisting arrest with violence, which I did not do. And I know this is a hot button issue in our day and age. I mean, again, this was, this was 24, 25 years ago when this happened. Uh, and it's gotten worse now, but I don't want to get into the whole police brutality thing. But I can say for all of those of you out there who are very um, uh, hot about it, I get it. I was beat and they were going to put me in prison. While I was in the jail, awaiting the court date, the evangelist from the Bill Glass evangelism uh, tour came in and they began to give testimony. And I had a friend in New York who was a heroin addict at the time. And I was just about to move up to New York City to be part of a major uh, media project. And I was going to live with her until I got my bearings in New York City. Well, God said no. I mean, he had his hand upon my life before I got saved. The night before I was going to move is when I got arrested and put in jail. So uh, condensing the story, I got saved. They gave me this little paperback Bible, and they said, start in the Gospel of John. And I just started reading the Bible rapidly. I, I even enrolled in like, you know, prison Bible school while I was there, because when I got saved, I really got saved. When I got saved, I was really at rock bottom. When I got saved, I had already lost everything. I didn't have to count it all lost, you know, by following Christ because I'd already lost it all. And so in that moment, you know, when I got saved in that jail, I just wanted to, to serve the Lord. I just, I figured I'd get out of jail and go work for some ministry writing. I, I never thought I would preach, teach, pray, prophesy. I just wanted to write for the Lord. And so that was, um, you know, about 20 years ago. I think the thing that fascinates me about your personal story is um, you in times past, I've heard you share the story the night before your husband leaves, you go out and do the family thing. You oh, have this yeah. Family tradition, mm -hmm. you know, for the time and season it was, and you go out and do this family you wake up and your family's ripped apart. And, mm -hmm. you know, here you are eventually sitting in, in this jail cell. And I, for me, because I family, I mean, you know, this family is very, very important for me. So I've always, it's always weighed in the back of my mind what that was like of all the times to pull this crazy stunt of just, you know, fleeing, you know, why after the family moment when it's just torn apart like that. But this is what, it, when you say, you know, the rock bottom, because there's a lot of people that are listening and, and they go, oh, yeah, I know about the prison, you know, salvation and all that. And yeah, jail time, <laughs> Jesus. So, yeah. But this truly is. I mean, you have this pivotal moment where it, it was the lowest of the low that you could get. And it helped really kind of elevate you and position you up to be able to understand, OK, I got to throw everything that I have now to Christ in this. So your plans change, you know, you're going to move away, but all that begins to shift. And mm -hmm. this background, this is, this is what's fascinating. I think a lot of people fail to understand is you were that writer. The writer was already in you. That was, yes. that was something that you were cultivating and you knew that it wasn't a surprise to God to say, Oh, Jennifer LeClaire can write. So let's use her for the kingdom now. This was always there. How was that process of, okay, now I'm born again, but now everything that I've done, I can start to turn this towards the kingdom. How does that look and unfold for you? Well, yeah, you know, so I get out and this was during the dot-com bubble crash, the economy crashed in 2000, um, 2000, 2001, that period. And all of the freelance journalism just went away. So I had to start my life all over. I'd spend every penny I had getting out of jail and I thought, well, yeah, I started listening to Charles Stanley. Doctor, I love Dr. St Charles Stanley. I started listening to him and T.D. Jakes and Joyce Meyer. And I thought, I'll work for one of their ministries, right? The problem is I had no word in me whatsoever. I mean, I could write like the wind. I was really a good writer, journalist, very successful. I mean, I was getting paid three, dollars $4,000 a week as a journalist in the 90s. I was really good. It was the grace of God the whole time. But I was, I was so I, I, I didn't know anything. Now, I ended up in an apostolic church. And about two years after I got saved, I was in that church 
And they found out that I could write. I was a journalist. And they said, oh, we're going to start a magazine. And so they did. And I became the editor of a magazine called The Voice. And it wasn't just a church magazine. I interviewed Joyce Meyer, Reinhard Bunke, Miles Monroe, uh, anybody and everybody was on the cover. It was a quarterly magazine. So God prepared me in that season, put me in a church where I could really grow and learn and somebody there to mentor me. And I was editor of a, of a valid Christian magazine. So that's how it started. And then little by little, you know, I started writing books. 2007, I wrote my first book, The Heart of the Prophetic. Um, and then from there, man, I just, I just, okay, that was the shift, you know, that was the shift. And then later on, what was it? 2000, 2010 is when I started, uh, as a news editor at Charisma. So God did it little by little and anybody listening, you have to understand that as fire as you are and, and as, how many ever prophetic words you have, some things really do happen little by little. Like I couldn't get saved and go work for Charles Stanley. I didn't have, I wasn't prepared. So uh, it was a process. That's something that I, I, I want to highlight because I think for a lot of people, when they look at your work right now and they see so much of a catalog and they see what you're doing in South Florida and they see you're traveling, you're launching these ministries all over the world. A lot of people go, okay, you know, must have had a silver spoon in her mouth or must <laughs> somebody must have done this and that sort of thing. You know, there's, there's the physical price that you pay. One, you lost your family. Now, granted, that wasn't that was a, a worldly manner that had happened. You weren't serving God in that manner, even though you can be serving God and horrible things happen to you uh, in that process. But I think a lot of times people fail to see the price that you have paid in those years of, you know, what are just some of the examples of things that you had to endure that help make you more the person that you are right now? Well, that's a great question. You know, first, yeah, he, him leaving the way that he did, you know, having to watch my daughter scream for daddy every night for six months, um, you know, um, losing everything that I had, having been gone to jail, I, I literally came out, I was on food stamps and, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's not supposed to be a permanent solution, but it was shame. It, it shamed me because here I was making three, four thousand dollars a week. I could go anywhere, do anything I want. Now I'm, I'm living in, 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 in Ozark, Alabama, the backside of the woods. You know, I mean, like population 1000, it was like Mayberry. And I mean, cause that's all I could afford. I had literally, God literally put me in the wilderness. I had no friends. I knew nobody. And that's where I began to learn, you know, to hear the voice of God more. But I mean, I've been through betrayals. I, you know, I've, I, I, being a single mother, and trying to raise a child in the Lord and trying to run a business because I was a freelance writer. Why? I'd always been a freelance writer. I, I had to work from home. I, I could not go out. I could not raise my daughter rightly and, 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 and make the kind of money I needed to pay the bills, um, you know, working a nine to five somewhere. I mean, I know so many, so many single mothers are, are in poverty. If you look at the statistics, the majority of single mothers in America are below the poverty line. And, you know, it, I just, I worked really hard that I worked at a church full time for free, 40 hours a week. I just, I just went all in, but I always put her first. And that came with a price because I couldn't travel in ministry. I, I, I didn't just date, you know, anybody. And I, I made a commitment to the Lord. I'm not going to bring men all around all the time. Like you see so many other single mothers doing desperate to, to get some kind of help and support. The Lord said, I'm your husband then. And I will take care of you and you flow in my timing. And so, you know, I, I pay the price of what the social life, which is really what, you know, pay the price of getting up at four o'clock in the morning, which, you know, sometimes that does get old. But in order to do what I do, I've had to just go all in and not look back. There's this Misty Edwards song, you know, um, you know, burning the just burning the bridges. Um, and, and it's it, 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 I, like when I said, when I got saved, I really got saved. When I got out of jail, my parents at the moment, they thought you have jailhouse religion and we don't like you this way. Go back into jail and then come back out again, like how you were before you went in. But it, it, it's, it's all or nothing. This life is, is what, 70, 80, 90 years and eternity is forever. So I just made a decision a long time ago, whatever comes my way, I'm just going to endure it like a good soldier and keep pressing. And it's not easy, man. It is not easy. You know, some of the, some of the stuff I've been through, the betrayals, the backstabbing, um, you know, and being a woman and being a single woman, um, I don't think about that too much, but in reality, I know it makes it hard. I don't have a husband to, to stick up for me or, but you know what? The Lord is my husband. So 
uh, I've just gotten used to that idea. It's something um, I thought about, you know, because I knew that we had this time scheduled for this. And Jennifer is probably one of the most busiest people I've ever known in my life. I, I think in a lot of ways, she's probably got a more head to schedule than the president in the United States. But, you know, <laughs> that's neither here nor there. But um, I've never seen the work mentality in anyone like I have, Jennifer. And I was recently, I just done an interview for uh, someone else, another thing, actually this week. And he asked a question about, you know, the definition of my own life. And I said, I kind of laughed and I said, I feel like I have endured more failure than I have success. Wow. And uh, I said, but I've had to learn that success is not a, uh, a moment or a pivotal um, catalyst, you know, of I made it to here. Success is in the ability to get back up when That's you've right. been knocked down. And this is one of the things that I, I, when I said that also, because um, the person who was interviewing me was getting ready to also interview you. And um, I said, that's what reminds me so much of Jennifer is she, she keeps getting back up. And I want the listeners and those that are watching to understand because, um, you know, you, you have to get into your understanding that this is, this is, first of all, a woman, female. And let, if we just go down that road, you know, you got so many people, oh, God can't speak to a woman. God can't use a woman. God can't, you know, that's, that's first and just in that. But then you take the reality that she's divorced. Oh, dear God. Now we've got an issue right here. But not only that, Jennifer's in South Florida leading a thriving ministry there as an apostolic overseer of the ministry there. Ministers there many, many Sundays and prayer nights and worship nights and so on and so forth. Aside from that, she's launching uh, revival hubs, prayer hubs, house of prayers. Uh, she's leading fast and, and all this while putting out a book every other Tuesday. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the books do come out a lot, but, and, and doing videos. And for those of you that may not be familiar, she said getting up at four o'clock in the morning, leading prayer every single morning and i've seen this firsthand we've been in same conferences staying uh relatively you know in the same uh hotel chain or whatever and you you after a service you go out to eat you hang out with people and stuff and and jennifer would either not hang out late or say i gotta go back because i gotta get up early in the morning and my mind would just say Oh, can't you get somebody else to do that? You're on the road, <laughs> but it's that commitment. I I want to I want to I'm, I'm sharing all this because of all the times that you feel like you've been knocked down. What is it that you're telling yourself in order to get back up again? What What is that that you're saying to Jennifer mm -hmm. to say you can't stop here? What are you What it, What is it that is driving you even more? That's a good question. Um... If I'm honest, it's really more than one thing. The first thing is because I know God called me and I know I'm going to have to stand before him. That's a real fear of the Lord is, is a big motivator in my life. The spirit of the fear of the Lord. I mean, it's a real thing in my life. He tells me to do something. I mean, I know he's not going to strike me dead if I disobey, but you know, he's called me to do something. And the Bible says to speak worthy of your calling. Um, I see when I was in my twenties, I was lazier than all get out. I, 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 when I was 18, 19, I had like 14 jobs in one year because I'd work long enough to, uh, get money to pay the bills and I'd quit the job. Then I'd go get another job two weeks later. I was a lazy, uh, when I was younger and something just clicked. Um, when I got saved in particular, I also look at, you know, what God's given me to steward. And he's given me a lot of responsibility. Who, who, those who have uh, been given much, God expects much, right? It's, uh, it, we're responsible for much. And I look at what, by the grace of God, me and the team have built. And if I take my foot off the pedal, it's going to fall apart pretty quickly. Um, I don't have all the backup systems that some other ministries have. Finding the help it has been a problem. 
We've had video editors who have just walked in church on Easter morning and resigned and, you know, out of nowhere for no reason. Um, we've had, uh, you know, other pastoral staff who one day just walks in and says, Lord told me to move away and leaves. And you're aware of these situations. So we, you know, we try to hire the right people. We can't get the right people or they betray us. There's a spirit down here in South Florida, Leviathan that twists things up. So I look at what the Lord has put in my hands and I say, you know, if, if I have to do it by myself, well, I don't want to, and I'm not supposed to, but if I have to in certain seasons, I can't let it fall apart. It's how does that bring glory to God for the church to shut? And believe me, I've thought many times about shutting it down. We've had those conversations. Like I don't, I, you know, some of the stuff I don't, I don't, I particularly like some of it. But one time, you know, I was really wanting to let, I was really wanting to shut Ahab down. I'll be honest. I was wanting to just shut it down. And the Lord said to me, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. I'm like, excuse me. He's telling me this is the will of the Lord. And is it to keep me humble? Because it's, a, you know, sometimes I feel like Ahab's a thorn in my side. I do. I love what God is doing there in this season. We have a group of on fire millennials there. Uh, but, but I mean, that's where most of the betrayal comes. That's where, uh, that's where I put most of my time and see the, 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 the least fruit. Um, but that is where the true discipleship happens. Um, that is where people's lives are truly transformed. And you can take my schools and your life can be touched and, and, tra- and transformed and we get testimonies, but it's not like me being there with you all the time. So, um, I guess I just, I, the bottom line answer is the fear of the Lord is what drives me. I can't let my hand off the wheel. That fascinates me. Uh, I mean, that really, really does because I don't hear people talking about the fear of the Lord. I, it, it is, it's not in a lot of people's vocabulary vocabulary um and they don't they don't talk about it because fear is often something that is attributed to oh i'm i'm terrified of god but what you're saying is it's the being responsible for the life that you've been given and Mm -hmm. that fear drives you in that um if if you were going to look on this on on that example of being responsible for what God gave you and having that fear of the Lord and it not being, I'm terrified of God. It's more right. of a reverent, holy fear. Who is it that when you read the word of God, who is it that you look at their life and you build that inspiration back and encouragement back over your life? Who Whose life do you see? And you go, oh, I can find my encouragement in this story, this passage of scripture. Now, who's that that stands out? It would have to be David in the Old Testament and Paul in the New Testament. You know, the Bible says, you know, he who has been forgiven much loves much, which I feel like I've been forgiven of a lot. Uh, and the lovers will always outwork the workers. And so you see David, he had such a love that he had such intimacy with the Lord. But he was a worshiping warrior. And Paul just had that apostolic rhythm. He was stoned. He was beaten. They left him for dead one time. He was shipwrecked. I mean, all these things happened to Paul. And, you know, when I look at Paul, uh, or even David, he had Absalom, you know, his child died, he, he sinned. He, he, I mean, all these things that happened to David and, and Paul, I'm like, you know, nothing like that's happened to me. So I'm not going to sit here and whine. I mean, you know, I'm not getting beaten. I'm not on a ship freezing to death, starving. Um, I'm not you know, having to build tents to, to make a living. Um, I work really, really, really hard, but I mean, I've got it pretty good. You know, I mean, I've got, I've, I've made money in the business world to where I'm not in debt. God has just really set me up for success. And I believe part of the reason he did that because he, he has vowed to take care of the orphans and the widows in his word. He'll take care of the orphan. And for all intents and purposes, I'm a widow, right? When your husband just gets up and leaves, you never see him again, no alimony, no child support, no nothing. You're, you're, essentially, he's dead, right? So um, you know, I just believe that because of what the, the trials and tribulations I've had to go to, there's been a, a, like this grace extended. Uh, on my life where I've, you know, never, you know, I, I work hard, but I don't struggle. And it's the grace of God in me that does the work. So yeah, I get tired sometimes. And sometimes I don't want to do it anymore. And sometimes I have to take my foot off the brake for a day or two, or three or four and go rest. We were just up in Moravian Falls, just, just resting, you know, but uh, for the, and then that's natural, and that's normal, and that's healthy, and that's good. But, um, but yeah, it's, 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 um, it's Paul and David. So how come it you would do you feel like other individuals whether they're in leadership roles or they're just you know serving the lord how come do you, do you feel like that there is a lack of 
holy fear, a reverent fear to the Lord right now, because I want to expand on that just a little bit because um, it, it, people would misunderstand the statement if I said Jennifer's driven by fear. They would totally misunderstand that statement. Yeah. But what is really driving your commitment to the Lord is the accountability and that mm-hmm. holy fear. But why is it that we don't see that in so many other individuals' lives? Well, you know, I think that people, we're, especially in America, we're just, we're, we're, we're so comfortable. Um, there's uh, most churches, if you're, if we're honest, don't put a demand on the anointing on people's lives. Uh, they just want to, it's nickels and noses. They want to fill seats. So the expectation, you know, of, of many pastors is, is you just show up. They don't care too much about what you do the rest of the week. The apostolic is not about spectators. It's not a spectator sport. The apostolic is about equipping you to do what God's called you to do. That's why many apostolic churches are smaller but I don't think that the church model as it stands really equips people. They don't talk necessarily too much about the fear of the Lord. Um, they don't teach people how to hear from God. I'm not saying every church. I'm just saying the, the church model as it was handed down to us. I mean, let's face it. Not every church even believes in apostles and prophets. So I think it's, it's, it, it, we do what we see modeled to us. And if, you're, if your pastor isn't walking in a reverential fear of the Lord and holiness, if you don't discern that about them, you don't have a standard. So you know, the pastor is not Jesus, but the pastor or the apostle, the prophet, the set man or set woman of the church, that's like the model of Christ. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. And, you know, Paul just didn't put up with this stuff. He wrote letters to the churches. He said, get it together, guys. There was a demand. There was an expectation. And I don't think many leaders are putting that demand or expectation on people. I mean, they may be volunteer, volunteer, volunteer. But what about your spiritual life? You know, with my millennials, we've, you've got to meet them. We've got a group now, a lot of millennials in the church. And, you know, they'll come and ask me this or that. And I'll say, what are you thinking? You know, because they told me we want to be corrected. I said, oh, all right. Oh, boy. They want to be rebuked. They want to be corrected. And like they were going to go over to dinner somewhere at some guy's house. And and they're like, one of them reached out. And I said, what are you thinking? That there's like perversion all over this. What are you doing? And they're like, okay, never mind. And they all decided not to go. So, you know, but, but are pastors accessible enough? Are we really discipling people? Because if we were truly discipling people, you know, in the love of Christ, that would include the fear of the Lord and everything else that goes with it. You said something and it triggered a question. And, 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 and the thought is, do you feel like in, in Western Christianity, let me, let me narrow sort of down. In Western mm-hmm. Christianity, we have misdirected the scripture, you know, touch not thine anointed. We've misdirected that scripture to where we don't have individuals serving the house of God in a right fear of the Lord, but they serve out of the fear of man. That's exactly right. It's something that uh, I think is creating the hardships for individuals. And, and I'm, I'm going back. The reason I ask that is I go back to what Jennifer starts this podcast off. You know, I had nothing and then I found Christ. It is a first love. Uh, and, and, and I think a lot of times man can easily distort the scripture and our love can easily be distorted as well. And in our efforts to be pleasing and satisfying to other individuals, we have a false alignment with them. And, and, and I want people to understand that because the, the Christian life is got its challenges. Um, but we have to be right with the word of God. And this is one of the things that there's a lot of people that are putting out a lot of books and books are coming out, you know, by the thousands, it seems like. But when you get a hold of one of Jennifer's books, one of the things that I absolutely appreciate is it is filled with scripture. It's not just opinionated or ideas or, you know, if you do this, you get this. It is, this is what the Word of God says. And so let's look at the Word of God and expound from there. There seems to be in our culture that misdirected scripture towards man, but at the same time, the lack of the knowledge of the Word of God. Do you, you travel, you travel across this world. Do you see the growing 
um, I, I would say the growing concern of a lack of knowledge towards scripture. It's it's really bad. I mean, there's really a word famine, if you could call it that. I don't know who first used that term. Um, but I mean, based on the emails to the ministry that we get and based on the, the, the Facebook comments, even on my prayer broadcast in the morning, the stuff that people say, I mean, I'm not trying to be, you know, prickly, but I mean, that does it, that's not even in the word and they're liking the statuses of false prophets and they're sharing saying, amen. It's like, do you not discern that this guy is just trying to get everybody's money? So yeah, if they knew the word and, and that's why I'm so grateful, I'm so grateful that they gave me that Bible when I was in jail, I was there for 40 days. I mean, I read it and read it and read it and I never stopped reading it. Um, the word is our foundation. Yeah. We don't leave the Holy spirit out, but yeah, there is a, there's a lack of the knowledge of the word. People just don't even know the basics. It just, I don't, and that goes back to number one, are you in a church? Number two, are you in a Bible teaching church? Because I, you know, here's the thing too. And this is an interesting, I know you'll appreciate this. If you look at almost every great Christian figure uh, over the last hundred years, think about like who the big people are today. Okay. Bill Johnson. Uh, okay. Mike Bickle. Um, Joyce Meyer. Okay, Marilyn Hickey, I, you know, let's go back a little further. Oral Roberts, um, uh, A.A. Allen, all these people were teachers. They weren't preachers. And I'm not saying we shouldn't preach because Jesus taught and preached. But, and T.D. Jakes is a great preacher. Uh, and there's great preachers. But it, it's, it, the Bible says, you know, when the, when the word is sown and the, and the person has no understanding, the enemy comes and snatches up the word before it can even get in their heart. That's the value of teaching. And I feel like we have a lot of churches right now where people, and part of it is not the pastor's fault. Part of it is the fault of the people because they won't come and sit and endure sound doctrine. They just want to have their ears tickled. And if you can get up and hype the crowd, then you'll have a full church every Sunday. I saw a certain mega church preacher and he was teaching intercession on YouTube, teaching. And, the, and finally he, he looked around, he goes, are you all awake? are you all awake? And he was getting frustrated because I'm trying to teach you something that's going to help you. And so what did he, he just kicked it up into high gear and started da, 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 because that's the only thing people respond to. So I've been trying to really emphasize, and I really, I'm more of a teacher. I can preach, I can get going, but you know, I'm more of a teacher. And I just find that most of the greats were, why? Because that's, what's changing minds is the teaching of the word, the preaching pricks your heart and gets you excited, gives you a passion. But without, if it doesn't really get down in there, then, you know, what good is it doing? So I don't even know how we got on that, but yeah, the word famine. No, I, I, I love that because um, I, I believe, unfortunately, we've become a generation that can quote memes, but can't quote scripture. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and that's just the truth of the matter. Things are being said that are likable, shareable, and retweetable, but they're not biblically ground. And you or I can't make people understand that. They have to understand that by getting in the word of God themselves. Yeah. Um, because there's a lot of things that sounds good. And because it sounds good, it automatically becomes accepted. And it doesn't, mm. it, you, you, you get people to understand this is not God. How can this not be God? This is good. You know, there, there's that <laughs> battle in there. How can you tell me this is a good, how is it wrong for me to think this way? Well, it's not God. Yeah, but it's good. So, you know, I want there's that implement there's that battle back and forth. But you mentioned a younger generation and how you're raising them up and you're discipling them. And I know this firsthand too because you're launching places all over the United States, all over the world. And for those of you that may have uh, wondered when Jennifer said AHOP, that is Awakening House of Prayer. And AHOP has different. Um, places that she's birthed. And one of them, you know, for example, I think of Ahop Perth, and that's a young man that is leading that. But it, it's Jennifer is, you know, working with this young man and his wife and his family, and, you know, cultivating that and so on and so forth. And they're launching all different places that Jennifer has these launching out. But in this process, you know, it, I also see you because what some people may not know is when you go to Jennifer's, there is that, that younger generation there. There's a strong older generation that's there as well. 
Mm-hmm. And it, it's about the merging of the generations. And so mm-hmm. what I'd like to ask you is, what's the challenges that you've ran into in trying to get the generations to merge? Gosh, um, I, I don't know. Everybody just gets along real well for the most part. I think that, um, you know, one young girl, I wish she's 28, um, she was one of the first young people to really plug in. She came maybe, you know, a year ago. She drove down, she said, from a dead dumb church in Tallahassee or Jacksonville and just came in, in her car, not knowing where she's going to go. And she came to come to AHOP. So she says, I have, and at that point, we had a lot of people my age, you know, um, and, and a good number of people, you know, Pastor Plar and Pastor Mitch are in their 60s. Um, and we had a lot of, she said, I came here and I was like really one of the only young people. And she said, I had so many grandmas and grandpas. And she said, I liked it. I felt safe. So there hasn't really yet been any real challenges. These, these grandmas and grandpas, they just love these young kids. And the young kids that we have, uh, they really respect the older generation. So I've been blessed in that. I think when revival hits, that's where we're going to see an issue. Um, and revival, with this many young people pressing and pressing, they come to all the, every time the doors are open, these young people come to church. Uh, with that fervor, uh, I think that's when we'll begin to see offense and, and maybe, hopefully not, Hopefully not. Hopefully we have a healthy enough community, but um, I, I don't know. I can't even think of a challenge. I think that's one of the greatest areas. It was the millennials coming in, especially over the last you know few months and just really getting to know them. That's been one of the brightest spots of my life in a long time because the Lord told me in 2015 to pour my life out as a drink offering for the next generation. And then I had a couple young kids on staff that went horrible. You know, I had another other spiritual sons over here turned into you know absolute the wrong way couldn't couldn't stop the the train wreck and i've had a lot of have had a lot of them fall away and it's heartbreaking so to have these here in my own house you know so far so good you are uh very very dedicated to prayer um that is self-evident to me but for those of you that may not be familiar why why is it for you why is prayer one of those things that you will not bend on? <laughs> it because in 2012, the Lord told me to make prayer my life's work. I was sitting in a prayer room. I was sitting in a prayer room in Miami. And I was decompressing from, um, you know, a season of being in a very abusive church and didn't really know where to go. I kept trying to go to different churches and plug in. But when they found out who I was, they just wanted me to help them write their book. I couldn't even go to a church and just go. In 2012, I started just going to the prayer room just to be with God. And um, he said, make prayer your life's work. So it comes back down to God told me to do it. That's why I'm not bending on it. You know, Cho, David Yonggi Cho, he had a saying, you know, I pray. Cause they said, how, how are you so successful, uh, you know, Pastor Cho? I mean, you've got a 24-7 prayer movement. You've got the, one of the largest churches in the world, like what, a million people in a church. And he said, how are you? They said, how are you? He said, I pray, I obey. And so I've adopted that. I pray, I obey, and I prophesy along the way. If God told me to do it, it's non-negotiable. Here's the thing, though. When, when God tells you to do something, it really is non-negotiable. But when he tells you to do something and to make prayer your life's work, that's a big word. Because I write books. I build churches. You know, I, I teach. But at the foundation, that's what I'll be remembered for. We have 130 prayer hubs now. That's amazing. Uh, we have eight houses of prayer. Uh, we're having a special prayer call on Tuesday. I'm in touch with them all the time. So, and, and, but see, I'm only now stepping into, that was 2012. I'm only now really stepping into where I really understand what God even meant. It took me eight years, not all of eight years, but six years to, you know, first thing I did was start a house of prayer, but it's because the Lord said it. And anytime the Lord gives you that kind of commissioning, you better believe that all hell is going to come against you. That's why your book, you know, uh, you know, contending for your miracle is so powerful because people think people are going to prophesy and it's going to happen. No, God told me that. And I lost every friend I had. I got betrayed five times. You know, I mean, it was just a, it's been one of, it's been the, the, I, I tell you, the, the Awakening House of Prayer has been the biggest challenge of my life. And it's a love hate. I love it, but so I'm like, if I could just, that's why I liked going to London every month because I was, I was gone one weekend a month and you came down. And, you know, you got to deal with all of it uh, for that year. 
So, but, but I, but I do love it. So that's how it's going to be when God calls you to do something, you're going to love it, but you're also sometimes going to wish you didn't have it. So, and that's how, you know, it's God because it's, it's going to be hard. Yeah. I, we need this, uh, <laughs> we need this world to balance itself back out so we can get back on that schedule again. I'm, I'm just coming yeah. down there. That's, <laughs> that's for sure. But it's, you know, I, it, it's one of these things. Um, Jennifer definitely walks in a very apostolic call. She is, has a heart for so many people. And I have seen it firsthand. I've seen her pour her heart out and help people for them to ultimately take advantage of, manipulate, or, you know, stab in the back, all that other stuff you're playing. But she keeps pouring into people no matter what. She just keeps pouring into them. I see all that. But I wonder, how do you as an individual, you you go through all that, but not only that, I mean, every single thing that you post, whether it's video, whether it's a status, whether it is, you know, a 30 second word of encouragement, you are bombarded by slander, accusations, mockery. Uh, I, I don't know if I know another person that endures a mocking spirit like you do. There's people <laughs> that constantly mock you. And it, it's, it's like, oh, my gosh, uh, it, how, do, how, do, how do you not just every once in a while punch a wall or scream or this name? <laughs> how, how do you endure that kind of uh, slander towards you as a person? Yeah, you know, I when when I first started publishing stuff on blogs, when I built my own ministry site and published blogs, because the the Voice magazine didn't really have much of an online component at the time. It was, you know, it was two thousand. With the Voice magazine, it was like two thousand three. People weren't on the internet like they are today. Uh, there were blogs, but um, I remember when I in about two thousand ten, I started posting my own blog on my own. And people would, I mean, I wasn't even known that much. I mean, like, I don't even know how these people were finding me. They would come on and just attack. And at the time, I mean, it made me mad. I would call all my friends and say, look what this guy said. Now go on there and debate him for me. Go tell him he's wrong. And I had very uh, thin skin um, comparatively. Now, when I was a journalist, though, I said I had thin skin. That was a different kind of persecution. As a journalist, you had to develop thicker skin than the general population. I had to, to do hard interviews. I had to, to, to ask bank directors why that money was missing. I had to investigate and I had to deal with rejection. You, you, you try to get jobs at different magazines and they send you reje- back in the day, they sent you rejection letters. So I had to develop a little bit of a thick skin. But ultimately, when I got to Charisma, that's what, that's what did it. Um, I blame Charisma because that platform just opened me up and they're just, they're just nasty and wicked. So what I do is I took a page from Catherine Coleman. Um, and Catherine Kuhlman used to say that she never read the, the mail. So today that's the equivalent of Facebook comments. She said, I don't read it because I don't want to get torn down and I don't want to get too lifted up. So I try for the most part not to look. Unfortunately, things do get in, um, in my purview sometimes. As a matter of fact, some of the young people were telling me there's people in the back corner of my church gossiping about me in my church, in my church. They said, what do you want to do about it? They're like, they're like, we'll punch him. We'll punch him. You know, what, what do I want to do about it? And I said, you know, I, I, I don't know. Go confront him, but don't tell me about it. I don't want to know. Cause I got to minister to these people. So I try, I just try not to look at it. And when I see it, I, I just, I've, I've trained myself. I know it's hard to believe. Just pray for them. Lord, just help them because it, it doesn't affect me. I know who I am. And so it doesn't bother me. It, it's irritating sometimes. And every once in a while, I'll, I'll tell somebody, look, you don't know what you're talking about. But for the most part, I just, number one, I try not to look. Number two, I, I don't let it get in my heart. I don't let it get in my head. Um, I don't care. People that want to say whatever, they've got an issue. I don't have an issue. So that really, that's the long and short of it. I just, eh, I don't care. That's, you said the statement that I've heard you say so many times. I know who I am. Mm-hmm. We've been on a lot of panels for Q&As and I, I you know, the, I, I've heard you say that. I know who I am. So if this person criticizes me, dislikes me, hates me, whatever, you know, that's their opinion of me. But mm-hmm. I know who I am. And it, it's something I want everybody that's listening and watching. You've got to really know that uh, because mm-hmm. you can't 
you can't run away from the criticism. The critics are out there. Uh, I mean, they're going to come and they're going to attack. I just got a piece of mail today. Someone actually printed out on their, their printer and a, a postcard and printed out. And I mean, it was addressed to me and um, it was just, you know, just blasted. And I thought, it's to me, it's funny that you took the time to create a postcard, and, <laughs> you really know, is. and and I just kind of laughed about it. But you can't out, you can't run away. It's going to happen. It's why it's so important to know your identity in this. And this is this is something that I hope that everybody's listening to this has heard this from Jennifer. You're, you're getting you're getting a rare glimpse of the Jennifer Leclaire. You know, everybody knows her for her books and her articles and her time at Charisma and all that. But this is something I wanted people to hear because I see this. I've seen this for years. I actually, uh, as we're recording this podcast right now, yesterday was the actual day many years ago that we met for the first time. And our relationship, what I've seen her and, and her steadfastness, her faithfulness, it has not swayed one ounce the entire time. And I've seen the things that she's endured and, and gone through. And, and I have a heart uh, for those that walk in similar shoes, such as Jennifer. You know, there's so many times she releases a prophetic word and people are quick to cut it off simply because she's a woman, simply because she's divorced, simply because she's leading a church. Lord, have mercy have I seen that. A woman can't lead a church and this and that and everything. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and it's just, it's, it's mind boggling. And I, I try to tell people, you know, you need to take some steps back. You need to look at what she's sharing and see what God is saying. If you can, you know, kind of put blinders on and, and take out of your head for a minute everything that mom or dad or grandpa taught you or what the world has taught you and, and, and so on and so forth and realize that God can use these individuals. And that's what I want people that's listening to this podcast to be able to recognize that there's a true daughter right there. There's a true daughter who is serving the Lord, who has been knocked down, but has learned to keep getting back up, who faces criticism. I'm telling you guys, you can't imagine the criticism that she faces. It's really remarkable. Uh, Mine is a pebble compared to what hers is, (laughs) but it's that love for the Lord. Uh, You know, it's more than the jailhouse salvation. It, it is, is something so profound in that. So I know you're a very b- busy person, got to schedule, but I got I to gotta ask you this one question if I can. In the season that we're in, uh, it is very topsy-turvy. It's a chaotic world. There are a thousand prophetic words going out right now. There are things that is, it seems like things are just going to disappear and life's going to go back to normal to there is the whole world is going to fall apart and the earth is going to separate at its core. You know, there, there's one end of the spectrum to the other. What do you feel like in this season right now to the body of Christ? What do you personally feel like God is saying to the body? Well, I think, um, and I shared a long message called the prophetic awakening. I think we are in the outer belief that we're in the outer band of the storm and that's applicable to South Florida, where I ministered the message because we have hurricanes here. And we know that, you know, you get the first, you know, flurry and, you, you know, the, the rains come and the, there's some heavy winds. And then, um, but the real storm is, is a little further out. And it may even seem like it gets calm before the real storm actually hits. The outer bands come, there's like a peace, and then here comes the storm. Um, I do believe there's a greater storm coming. I do not buy into the second heaven dreams that people have been releasing where, you know, DC is on fire and that's the enemy's plan. Um, Could it happen? It could be, but it wouldn't be the will of the Lord, nor is it the word of the Lord. Um, I believe it's going to get worse before it gets better. We may see things calm down for a minute or two. We kind of are seeing them calm down a little bit now compared to how it was in March and April. Um, But, you know, even into next year, I think it could get real hinky. And it's, it's, it's a matter of intercession. You know, what will we tolerate? What will we put up with? I don't believe we needed to have what's happened happen. I believe the intercessors have a tendency, and I can speak this of myself as well, where there's a big problem. We push, we push, pray until something happens. We push and push. We get the breakthrough. And then we're like, oh, I'm exhausted. We've been praying. We got that breakthrough. And then we're so exhausted that we, we're not praying to keep the breakthrough. So, you know, first of all, most prophets didn't even see the coronavirus. Um, 
the ones that are saying they saw it, many of them aren't telling the truth. They're hindsight prophets. You know, it's easy to tell you what you saw. Why didn't you say anything about it when you saw it? Um, you know, friend of mine, prophet uh, Sadhu uh, Sal- Sal- Salvador, I can't ever say his last name right, from India. Um, we've been talking via email and, you know, he's seen things in the next year as well. Uh, it can be shut down in prayer to a large part. It can be largely mitigated by prayer. However, I think some things do need to happen and it's part of the great awakening. Uh, we're seeing, you know, the remnant rising, the remnant church is rising up. Um, but we know that before every great awakening, things have gotten really bad, a lot worse than what we're seeing now. And I'm not prophesying that. I, I think that, you know, we, it doesn't have to be that way. It's only because people won't wake up. I mean, Israel didn't have to keep going into into um, Babylonian uh, bondage, you know, and, and they cry out to God and God would send a deliverer. And then after a while, they'd go back into bondage again because they sinned. So, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. The church can take this inflection point and choose right now to rise up. And it doesn't have to be the whole body of Christ, just the remnant, enough of us praying, pushing back this darkness. You know, we need better prayer strategies because the intercessors do get worn out. So, you know, a lot of this stuff doesn't have to happen, but if we don't pray, we're going to see some stuff that's worse than what we saw this year. So I, ha- okay. I, I'm sorry. I got to ask one more question. With that because, <laughs> You're fine. Um, I, I personally feel like I, I, and this is so on the spot. This is for those that are listening. This is a real time moment right here, but cause I have not asked you this, but this is something I've been warned with and weighing with that. There's been a, discontent among watchmen and gatekeepers and because of that discontent it's wow. it, it's hindered the ability to communicate through intercession as it should be you, i mean do you think that there's a, 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 any validation to that there is the, the, the communication at large even in the prophetic movement is really bad. We've, we've developed silos. We've got camps. This camp doesn't like that camp. You've got the judgment camp and the grace camp and the no warfare camp. And you've got the Bethel camp and the IHOP camp and all. And, and it's not necessarily wrong. What's wrong is we're not talking to each other and people draw such strong party lines where, you know, well, if, if that, if that camp said it, we're not going to, we're not going to buy into that. Right. That's what I love about Patricia King because Patricia King, she's just, she embraces so many people and she, she gives credence to what's true in a word, even if some of it's not right. But the communication is bad, really bad. The prophets and the intercessors aren't communicating. The watchmen and the gatekeepers aren't communicating. Maybe we don't have strong enough mechanisms to do so. Maybe we just don't want to. But part of the prophetic reset, God is actively working to break down those silos. It's because of our biases. It goes back to the this camp, this camp. You've seen the, the strife in the yeah. different camps in the body of Christ. I mean, there's certain leaders who once liked me, invited me on their mega church platforms, but now because I'm friends with so-and-so, they won't even answer my text. That's foolishness. It's childishness. And if that is going to continue, we will see things get much, much worse in America because God is saying, okay, well, the prophet, the watchmen are blind. The prophets are, are I read the scripture today, Jeremiah 5, the prophets are in wonder. That's not a good thing when the prophets are in wonder and the watchmen are blind. That's, that's a large part of why we're seeing come to America what's come to America. We didn't shut it down in prayer. It would appear that there's a large majority that are choosing preference over presence. Wow, that's good. So that's, that's what really kind of, because we do know it. I mean, there's individuals that, you know, if you, if you can't talk to them. You, you can't, talk yeah. to, you know, and that's really, that really speaks volumes to me. And, that, and, and that's the reason I had to go down that road because it, it, it's something that I'm being alerted to more and more mm-hmm. that it's got to be done away with. So for all those that may not, and you've had to be living underneath the rock to not know who Jennifer O'Clair <laughs> is, but for those that don't know about Jennifer, how do they find you? What's the quickest way? JenniferLeclaire.org. Just go to my website. From there, you'll find the church, the schools, everything else is under that sort of umbrella there. You'll find articles, everything you want to find it's right there. Now, again, she has written tons and tons and tons of books. Uh, she wrote the forward for my latest book uh, not long ago. I don't even know how she fit the time in. She must have done it when she was asleep or something. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, you have a brand new book out. And mm. that book is? Discerning Prophetic Witchcraft. And I love it because it's not just a number one new release. It actually hit number one in Pentecostal Christianity and spiritual warfare and discerning prophetic witchcraft. Like I said, I'm seeing people liking, I mean, this one, somebody put up a post, somebody told me about this. I didn't see it uh, at first, 
um, the, the spirit of Corona came and visited me in a dream and it sat on my bed and talked to me. And I'm like, okay, and people are liking this and sharing this. And I'm like, guys, what is the matter with this equation? So that's witchcraft. That, that wasn't the Lord. So we see these things going on and we, we really need to, to stop and read what we're reading before we like it. Much I know you've said that in the past. <laughs> and we, we need to understand, you know, the spirit of God and the ways of God, because there's a lot of prophetic witchcraft out there and it's doing a lot of damage to the body of Christ. A lot of people have shut prophets out because of the prophetic witchcraft, you know, the, the weight loss miracles, the money miracles. Yeah, the, a lot of the fluff and the, you know, the goofiness that comes with it that is unnecessary. You know, I and, and I know, listen, I could take every single book that Jennifer has put out and say, this is a now book. But dear Lord God Almighty, this <laughs> is a now book. <laughs> this is a, because I get, I'm one of those that get easily frustrated at the ignorance. And I mean that in the definition of the word, but the ignorance is in the body of Christ. Because liking those statuses and those posts and those memes and those, and I'm going, that's not even remotely scripturally correct. Mm -hmm. And it's, it frust you and I have had many conversations about this because it frustrates me because it's, it is so popular in the prophetic community. Mm -hmm. um, and it's simply because that stuff garners, you know, I, I've said it before. I feel like a lot of times the way that we portray God is that he is incapable of completing a sentence. Or he's spastic <laughs> because he's never actually doing anything he's about to or fixing to or soon enough. And this, and I'm not saying that God doesn't do those things. That's not what I'm right. implying. But it's like an overwhelming amount of stuff. And but those things they they're they're likable, they're tweetable, they're shareable, they're you know, and so on and so forth. So we have to get back to the Word of God. And this is where my wife and I absolutely love Jennifer, respect her, honor her. Uh, she means a lot to us and what she's doing. There's a lot of people that would criticize and harp and harp. You got to understand. Um, you you got to be willing to take a lot of stuff off and really look at the heart. And that for us, it's the heart. It's about Jennifer's heart. It's about what she's doing in the kingdom. You know, I'm sure there's things that I've done that Jennifer's kind of tilted her head and go, you know, I don't know about that, Ryan. Uh, there, there's things, and I've and I've had this conversation with Jennifer that she's she shared and go, you know, I'm just not there yet. You know, <laughs> give me a little bit of time. I got a lot of growth right here myself. And but that's the thing. That's the beauty about the kingdom, and and that's the beauty of when we are truly family. You know, those of you that are familiar with the Blacksmith Chronicles and what we do, and everything we do through RJM, kingdom is family. We. Mm -hmm learn to grow with one another, but more importantly, we learn how to pray, we learn how to honor, we learn how to respect, we keep cultivating that love and that encouragement, and we celebrate victories. We celebrate what's happening in other people's lives. So, Jennifer, uh, I don't know that I could say any more to say how much that we love you, we honor you, and uh, we appreciate you taking the time out. You're a busy woman of God, uh, but uh, Thank you so much for being part of this episode. Ryan, thank you and your family. You guys are dear to us and we can't wait till we can, you know, go have a revival somewhere and dance in the glory. <laughs> At least get some good coffee somewhere too. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I'm about to go get some good coffee right now, but thank you for having mm -hmm. me on this broadcast. I enjoyed the discussion, the perspectives. Uh, it's always great catching up with you. It means a lot. So for everybody else, we hope this podcast has equipped you, challenged you, and encouraged you in some way. Uh, until the next time we get together, guys, know that we love you and we bless you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for listening to the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast. It is our prayer that this episode challenged you, encouraged you, and equipped you for the advancement of the kingdom of God. For more episodes or ways that you can partner with Ryan Johnson Ministries, please go to www.ryanjohnson.us or email us directly at info at ryanjohnson.us. Please join us again soon for another episode of the Blacksmith Chronicles.
based on a startling encounter about a prophetic showdown coming to the body of Christ, where true and false prophets will be exposed, discerning prophetic witchcraft will equip you to be on the right side of the truth. This book exposes the supernatural divination deceiving spiritually hungry believers. Discern the signs of true and false prophets and prophecy. Avoid prophetic con artists. Escape charismatic witchcraft. Recognize witches and psychics posing as prophets and much more. Open your eyes to the divination trying to ambush your life with discerning prophetic witchcraft. Pick up your copy wherever books are sold.